Hey there, and welcome back. Today we're talking about Dynamorphia. We'll cover the entire archetype as usual, but we're going to pay special attention to a subset of the archetype that makes up a really cool package that can be splashed into a ton of different decks. And real quick before we get started, I put a ton of work into these videos, so if you like it and want to see more of this from me, I would really appreciate it if you could like and subscribe, and maybe also let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching, and now let's get started. At a high level, the goal of the package is to add a nice one-sided floodgate and two big monsters to your board, all by activating a single trap. And this comes at the cost of a relatively modest amount of space in the main and extra decks. After we go over all of the archetype cards individually, as well as what the package does and how it works, we'll cover what exactly the package looks like and how to tailor it to your deck and your needs. The Dynamorphia archetype premiered in Battle of Chaos and got a great second wave of support in Dimension Force. It's a fusion trap deck made up of high-tech dark dinosaur type monsters, and it focuses on paying tons of life points and gaining benefits based on how low your life points are. More specifically, almost all of the cards have an effect which requires you to pay exactly half of your life points for cost. Also, in case you aren't aware, when changing your life points in Yu-Gi-Oh, if you're left with a fraction of a life point, you always round up. So if you manage to get down to one life point, you can still activate all of your effects. You basically just get them for free. Some of the life point related effects depend on the exact number of life points you have at any given time, while others just can't be activated until you reach a certain life point threshold. So far, the archetype has unanimously agreed that 2,000 life points or less is that magic number, which is nice because that means you only have to activate two effects and then you're in that range. Now, getting so low on life points does sound scary, but this archetype has that covered. All of the traps have an effect that lets you banish them from the graveyard to protect your life points. This archetype also takes being a trap deck very seriously. There are literally only two main deck monsters and zero spells. It also has three fusion monsters and seven traps, three of which are counter traps, and the remaining four are normal traps. With so few main deck monsters and traps being inherently slow, you'd think this deck was a card advantage nightmare, but luckily every single one of the monsters has an effect to revive another one when it's destroyed by battle or card effect. So it may be a little bit slow to get everything into rotation, but once it's all there, the deck has a pretty good recycling resource loop. Now for the cards, we'll start with the main deck monsters, who have very similar and very simple effects. Dynamorphia Theresia is a level 4 dark dinosaur with 1500 attack and 0 defense. And when normal or special summoned, Theresia can set a Dynamorphia trap from your deck directly to your field. Then, if you have 2000 or fewer life points, Theresia permanently gains 500 attack. We should note here that this is actually way better than just adding the trap to your hand for two reasons. The first is that setting a back row directly from the deck can't be negated by by Ash Blossom. And the second is that if you activate this effect on your opponent's turn, then when it comes back to your turn, you can actually activate the trap, as opposed to having to then, on your turn, set the trap and wait until your opponent's next turn to be able to activate it. And finally, if Theresia is destroyed by battle or card effect, you can banish any trap from your graveyard to special summon a level 4 or lower Dynamorphia monster from your graveyard other than another Theresia. And of course, all of these effects are a hard once per turn. Dynamorphia Diplos is also a level 4 dark dinosaur, but with 1000 attack and 0 defense. If normal or special summoned, Diplos can send and one Dynamorphia card from your deck to the graveyard. It also has the exact same floating effect as Theresia, where you can banish a trap from your graveyard to special summon one level 4 or lower Dynamorphia monster from your graveyard, except for another copy of Diplos. Now remember, our traps do all have effects to protect our life points from the graveyard, but as we'll see later, we also have other ways to make use of the traps in the graveyard, so Diplos's effect to just dump a trap card to the graveyard can be a great way to get one of those trap effects into rotation. In fact, these monsters end up being the main way that we're going to get our traps into rotation, so we'll want to be resolving these on summon effects as often as possible. Luckily, all of our fusion monsters have a slightly better floating effect, so we'll be able to get access to new traps without always having to burn resources. On that note, let's turn our attention to the extra deck. First up is Dynamorphia Stealth Burgia. This is a level 6 fusion monster with 0 attack and 2500 defense, and it needs two Dynamorphia monsters with different names as material. First off, it has a continuous effect that once you're in that 2000 or lower life point range, you no longer have to pay life points to activate any trap or any Dynamorphia monster effect. Also, on hard ones per turn, when your opponent activates a monster, monster effect, you can quick effect burn your opponent for damage equal to that monster's original attack. And finally, just like Theresia and Diplos, Stealth Burgia can float into a level 4 or lower Dynamorphia monster from the graveyard when destroyed by battle or card effect. Notably, however, neither Stealth Burgia nor any of the other fusion monsters requires that you banish a trap from the graveyard to do so. Stealth Burgia offers a nice respite from having to pay so many life points, plus offers a little extra interaction to damage your opponent, which is really nice because control decks often struggle to get a whole 8000 damage on board in a single turn for an OTK. But as we'll see with these next two fusion monsters, you might actually want to get Stealth Burgia off the board at some point because there can be some really nice benefits for having your life points even lower than 2000. Next up is Dynamorphia Kentragena, who has the exact same level, type, attribute, and materials as Stealth Burgia. However, opposite to Stealth Burgia, Kentragena only has zero defense and a whopping 4000 attack, but it also has the effect that it loses 
increases attack equal to your life points. So when you need big damage, it's in your best interest to have as few life points as possible. Although there are a handful of other cards you can add to the deck to either turn this effect off or even reverse it, so honestly it's not even that big of a downside. But it doesn't stop there. During the main phase, you can quick effect a half of your life points and banish a Dynamorphia normal trap from your graveyard to copy that trap's effect. And of course, Kentrogena has the exact same floating effect as Stealthburgia, being both a huge beater and also an incredible utility tool. Obviously, being able to get up to 4,000 attack can be super tough to clear, especially when it has the ability to copy trap effects in the graveyard to gain more interruption or advantage. This also helps mitigate the fact that the deck can be pretty slow to get access to new cards from the deck. You don't need to generate a ton of advantage when you're getting double value out of some of the cards that you do search. Of course, how good this ability is depends entirely on how good those copyable traps are, so we'll see how good that payoff is in a minute. But spoiler alert, this effect is actually a pretty important piece of that splashable package. And finally, we have Dynamorphia Rexterm. This time, it's a level 8 fusion monster and requires a Dynamorphia fusion monster plus another Dynamorphia monster as material. But this time, they can have the same name, so if you end up in a situation where you think you need to use two of the same fusion monster to make this, that's totally okay. Also, Rexterm has 3000 attack and zero defense. Rexterm is the big boss monster that makes the splashable Dynamorphia package really appealing. His first effect is a powerful floodgate, which says your opponent cannot activate the effects of monsters they control that have an attack greater than or equal to your your life points. Of course, this only affects monsters on field, but that is where most monsters activate their effects anyway, especially ones with destruction and negation effects. Also, your life points get really low really fast, so this will very quickly encompass most monsters in the game. This is made even better by Rexterm's next effect. On hard ones per turn, you can quick effect pay half of your life points, and the attack of all monsters your opponent currently controls become equal to your life points until the end of the turn. So at any moment on a quick effect, you can lock down your opponent's entire board, as long as all of the monsters are able to be affected by monster effects. You have to be very careful Careful, though, because Rexterm does not negate effects, it just prevents activation. So if you chain this to an opponent's monster effect, that effect was already activated, so it will still resolve normally. Also, since it only affects the monsters your opponent currently controls, you have to pick the right time in your opponent's turn to do this. Otherwise, they could just use those monsters on field as material for something else that can activate its effects, like Heavenly Spheres, or one that just has enough attack to run over Rexterm in battle, like the arrival Cyber Zadig Mister. And finally, when Rexterm is destroyed, it floats into another monster from the graveyard just like the others, except this time, you can bring back a level 6 lower Dynamorphia monster. This means, of course, that you can bring back one of the other fusion monsters. If you want a high attack monster, you can bring back Entrogena, who can potentially double up a trap effect if you haven't used that effect this turn yet. Or if you just weren't quite able to finish your opponent off last turn, you can bring back Stealth Burgia for some nice burn damage. Now don't forget, whichever of those you choose to revive can then float into one of their level 4s on destruction, who can then also float into the other level 4 when it gets destroyed. This makes a really nice sequence of revivals, each of which will get you something when revived, that can make it pretty annoying to break through a Dynamorphia board. We'll talk specifics on how to optimally sequence these revivals after we talk about the traps, because then we'll have a better idea of what our Kentrogena can do in the middle of the opponent's turn, what our Diplos can put in grave, and what our Theresia can grab us for follow-up. So let's talk about those traps now. Remember that all of them have a second effect to banish themselves from the graveyard to protect your life points. Specifically, normal traps say that when your opponent activates a card or effect while you have 2,000 or fewer life points, you can banish this card from your graveyard as cost, and then you take no effect damage from your opponent's cards for the rest of the turn. Notably, this does not need to activate in response to an effect that's going to do burn damage, it can be any card or effect. So technically, if you wanted to be super over eager, the second you see normal summon Moye activate effect, you could banish one of these normal traps because you know at some point Long Yuan will come around and try to burn you. Now for the counter traps, they say that during damage calculation, while your life points are 2000 or less, if you would take battle damage, you can banish this card from your graveyard's cost, and then you take no battle damage from that one battle. It doesn't protect for the rest of the turn like the normal traps, but it's still a very nice effect. We'll cover the normal traps first, keeping in mind that these are the effects we can get twice in a turn by using Kentrogena. First up is Dynamorphia Frenzy. This is the last card we need to complete our splashable Dynamorphia package. Dynamorphia Frenzy says that during your opponent's main phase, you can pay half your life points to fusion summon one Dynamorphia monster, using exactly one material from your deck and one material from your extra deck. This is great because it allows us to go straight to Rexterm if we want, because it needs a fusion monster as material. Now that we have all the pieces, let's take a quick detour to check out what a standard play with the Dynamorphia package looks like. Your turn could be as simple as set Frenzy and pass. It could also be as complicated as a super long Link Climb Synchro Spam combo, as long as you end with Frenzy set in your back row. One of the nice things about this package is how unintrusive it is to your other strategy. Then, as soon as your opponent does something during the main phase, you can chain Frenzy, sending one monster from your main deck and one from your extra deck to the graveyard to summon Kentragena. Then, on resolution of that chain, activate Kentragena to copy Frenzy, sending two more monsters, and this time, summoning Rexterm. At this point, assuming nothing else has 
happened to your life points, you will be at exactly 2,000. You could then, on resolution of that chain, activate Rexstorm to take you down to 1,000 life points and quite possibly lock your opponent out of all of their on-field activated monster effects. But if you don't know what your opponent is playing, firing off Rexstorm right away can be super dangerous. Your opponent could have a lot of really low attack monsters that can get them to either some sort of removal for Rexstorm, or even just a high attack monster to run over Rexstorm in battle, allowing them to combo further after that. It can be a whole lot safer to just save Rexstorm's effect until your opponent commits a monster to the board, that way you might be able to stop a really important ignition effect. Or if you see they're playing a strategy that you know isn't about to get to any type of removal other than a big monster, you can just wait until they get the big monster out, then use Rexstorm's effect to set its attack down to your life points at 1000, and then you don't need to worry about its activated effects or it running over Rexstorm in battle. The last thing you need is to lose to a pure blue eyes deck just because you got a little too trigger happy with a quick effect. Also when we're playing this as a splash will package and not a full Dynamorphia deck, we have to remember that with Kentragena, we're banishing our one protection that we have. So if we drop to 1000 life points right away, and then it turns out our opponent is playing Sword Soul, we're almost definitely going to lose. Because if they can get to Longyuan without having to use any on-field activated monster effects, they're going to be able to burn us for 1200, because Longyuan's special summon and burn effects activate in the hand and graveyard respectively, so Rexstorm isn't going to do anything to stop that. But when we pull this off successfully, we end up with a nice floodgate and two monsters with 3000 attack. And all that is just on top of whatever our other strategy was able to accomplish. We'll talk more about the strengths and weaknesses of the package, as well as the archetype as a whole later, and we'll also talk about the types of decks that this package works really well in, but for now, we'll get back to covering the rest of the traps. Dynamorphia Domain is basically the same as Frenzy, except you have to use materials from your hand, deck, or field. Also, you're not limited to just one from each location, so if in the future there's another fusion monster that requires three materials, you could potentially use this card to summon it. Dynamorphia Alert lets you pay half your life points to special summon up to two Dynamorphia monsters from your graveyard whose total levels are at most eight, but it can't attack this turn, and you are locked into only special summoning Dynamorphia monsters for the rest of the turn. So you could straight up just bring back Rexstorm with this, or if you have Frenzy in the graveyard, you could bring back Kentragena to copy the Frenzy, and then this one card turns into two huge monsters. Also worth noting, this is the only card that will lock you into the archetype. None of the other cards will even lock you into a summoning mechanic. Dynamorphia Brute says that you can pay half your life points to non-targeting destroy one Dynamorphia monster you control, and one card your opponent controls. Initially, this sounds like a bad trade in terms of card economy, but remember that all of our monsters float into something else when they're destroyed. And with that, I want to make a quick note here about Brute, because it ties into something I mentioned earlier. This card can be a great way to both clear your opponent's board, and also get rid of your own Stealth Burgia when you think you might be ready to push for game. So let's say we have a game state where we have Stealth Burgia and Kentragena on board, as well as Brute set in the back row, and then at least one copy of each of the main deck monsters engraved. That's a super easy setup to get, because you're probably using Domain to summon at least one of the fusion monsters. You can then use Brute to destroy Stealth Burgia, and clear an opponent's monster, or something like a Mystic Mine, or some unknown back row card, then Stealth Burgia can float into Diplos, who can get another trap into Grave, and if you're low enough on life points already, burn your opponent for 500 damage. Then you can use Kentragena to either copy whatever Diplos sent to the Grave, or you can copy Brute to clear another one of your opponent's cards and destroy Diplos, who can float into Theresia. And at this point you should definitely have at most 2000 life points, so Theresia will get that 500 attack bonus, and of course set a trap to your field for follow up. Now let's do some math. Assuming we originally used Domain to get Kentragena, then used Kentragena to copy Domain to get Stealth Burgia, we would have 2,000 life points left. Then, Stealth Burgia would protect us from having to pay life points for a while until we initiate this play, and for simplicity, let's also assume that nothing else has happened to our life points. So initially, activating Brute, we wouldn't have to pay anything. But once Stealth Burgia is gone, we will pay to use Kentragena to copy it, putting us down at just 1,000 life points. This means we would have 3,000 damage from Kentragena, 2,000 from Theresia, and that 500 burn damage from Diplos, for a total of 5,500 damage. This means means that for this play to actually close out a game, Stealth Burgia would have at some point needed to burn our opponent for at least 2500 damage, or the game would need to have gone on long enough for us to have already had a battle phase where we could have attacked a little bit more. That's not totally unreasonable, but it's also not great. If instead we have Diplos dump another domain, we could have Kentragena copy that to make a second Kentragena. We would still have 1000 life points left, but now from on-field damage we would have 6k from the two Kentraginas, plus 1000 from Diplos if we summoned him in attack position, plus his 500 burn damage. This leaves us with a total of 7500 damage damage, which is a lot better, but remember, we also gave up one destruction with Brute by copying Domain instead, so it is possible that we would still need Stealth Burgia to have done even more than 2500 burn damage at some point, it really depends on what our opponent's monster lineup looks like. Another option is for Diplos to dump Frenzy, then have Kentragena copy it to get Rexstorm out. At this point we would still have 1000 life points left just like all the other plays, but the big difference being that we haven't actually used a Rexstorm effect this turn, so it can use its effect to have our life points one more time, this time leaving us with only 500 life points. Now we have 3000 damage from Rexstorm, 3500 from Kentragena, and again the 1000 attack and 500 burn from Diplos. This gives us a grand total of 8000 damage. Also, this comes with the added bonus of lowering 
all of our opponent's remaining monsters' attacks down to just 500. Also, we don't need Stealth Burgia to have done nearly as much burn damage, and if we can't quite close the game out this turn, we have Rexstorm's Floodgate on board to help protect us to make it more likely that we survive until our next battle phase to close the game out then. Now let's talk about the counter traps. Remember, these are the ones with the graveyard effect to protect you from battle damage, but there are only three of them, so this will go pretty quickly. First up is Dynamorphia Sonic, which says that when your opponent activates a spell or trap card while you control a Dynamorphia monster, you can pay half your life points to negate the activation, and if you do, destroy that card, then destroy one Dynamorphia monster you control. Technically, Sonic can get rid of your Stealth Burgia just like Brute does, but the fact that it has to react to your opponent activating a back row card makes it a lot less reliable for that purpose. Dynamorphia Shell says that at the beginning of your opponent's battle phase, you can pay half your life points to special summon a Dynamorphia token, which is a dark level 10 dinosaur with 0 attack and 3000 defense. And if you do, for the rest of this turn, while you control that token in your monster zone, your opponent cannot target other monsters for attacks except for that token. Shell is a bit of a weird one in that instead of trying to control the board state, it really just doubles down on battle phase protection. It gives you a large protective body while also putting itself in the grave to use its graveyard effect for another battle, but unfortunately, in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, these types of battle effects have really proven to be less than useful. In pretty much every situation, you would rather have something like Alert to bring back a Rexterm, whose attack would be the same as the token's defense, and could even just lower your opponent's monster's attacks so they can't run over your other monsters in battle anyway. Or something like Brute to stop your opponent from even setting up a board to attack with in the first place. And finally, we have Dynamorphia Reversion. It requires that you control a Dynamorphia Fusion monster, but other than that, Reversion is basically the exact same as Kentrogena's Quick Effect, except for Counter Traps instead, where you can pay half your life points to banish a Counter Trap from your graveyard to copy that card's effect. And for now, that's the whole archetype. Now that we've seen everything it has to offer, let's circle back to those monster floating effects, and how sequencing them properly can make a very difficult board for the opponent to break. Let's say you start your opponent's turn with only Rexterm on board and a graveyard full of other Dynamorphia cards. If they destroy Rexterm, you can float into Kentrogena. Then, if you haven't used her effect already, you can copy something like Frenzy to get another Rexterm. Then, if both of those get destroyed, Kentrogena can float into Diplos, who can then dump a trap to the graveyard. Then, if Diplos gets destroyed, you can banish that trap you dumped to get your Theresia back from the graveyard, who will then grab you another trap for follow-up. Then, if Theresia is destroyed and you have another trap left in your graveyard, you can finally bring back Diplos one more time. To fully break this board between battle and card effects, your opponent needs to be able to destroy six monsters. But what's really nice about this particular sequencing is you never have more than two of those on board at a time. So it's not like you have one board full of six monsters that can be wiped out with a big board breaker like Lightning Storm. Your opponent is going to need multiple different destruction effects to get through your entire board. Also, a slight variation on this, instead of using Kentrogena's effect to bring out another Rexterm, you could instead bring out a Stealth Burgia, which will not only give you a little bit of burn damage and protection, it'll also get you one more revival when it gets destroyed. It's not as strong as Rexterm, but it does make your board just that much more annoying to break. Now before we look at some great cards to pair with the archetype, let's turn our attention back to the Splashable package and talk about what exactly the package looks like and how to customize it a bit for your deck, and also what kinds of decks this package pairs well with. Let's start by considering the absolute minimum requirements. The package is based around resolving Frenzy to get some big dinosaurs on board. So for each fusion, you need exactly two monsters in the extra deck, one to summon and one for material, and one monster in the main deck. Plus, you need a copy of Frenzy to activate. If literally all you want to do is throw a Rexterm on board, then technically you only need two extra deck slots and two main deck slots. However, I would really advise against that. First off, if you're doing this, you really want three Frenzy to maximize your chances of pulling this off. Also, once you've gone all the way through and activated Rexterm's effect, this method will leave you with 2,000 life points. And most decks won't have any problem setting up a board at least as far as getting some sort of interruption or removal for Rexterm by just using monsters with less than 2,000 attack. A much better version, and what I usually play, is exactly what we described earlier, which means summoning Kentrogena first, then using that quick effect to copy Frenzy and summon Rexterm. That way, by the time you get Rexterm out, you'll be down at 2,000 life points, then you can use its effect to get down to 1,000 whenever you feel the time is right. This method then, of course, has double the monster requirement. Personally, the ratios I play are 3 Frenzy, 3 Theresia, 1 Diplos, 1 Stealth Burgia, 2 Kentrogena, and 1 Rexterm. If the deck I'm playing has a good amount of extra space, I might even play a Fossil Dig or two. It not only works as a good one card starter to get you into Rexterm, but it also works as excellent ash bait to insulate whatever your main strategy might be. I personally prefer to play 4 main deck monsters, and there are 2 reasons for that. The first is that more Theresia means more access to Frenzy on turn 1, and having 4 monsters protects you from drawing too many of your fusion materials, since remember they have to be in the deck to use, they can't be in your hand. If you're only playing 3 of them, then any game where you open 2 of your Dynamorphia monsters, not only are then all of your Frenzies totally dead, but then 40% of your opening hand is totally useless cards. If you're going to open that many Dynamorphia monsters, you really need the package to still be live, because otherwise you've just super bricked your hand for nothing. Alright, now that we have an idea of what the package looks like, let's take 
take a look at what kinds of decks it pairs well with. First off, it should be a deck with some wiggle room. The version we described above takes 4 extra deck slots, which is about 27% of it. If your deck is super tight on extra deck space, then the Dynamorphia package probably won't go well with it. On the other side, the version we described takes 7 main deck slots, so again, if you don't have the room for that either, this probably won't work. The package can work well with any deck that doesn't lock you into or out of certain things, like a specific type or attribute or level or archetype or a specific summoning mechanic other than fusion, unless of course the deck only locks you during your turn, because with the package we're really only ever resolving Frenzy on our opponent's turn anyway. But you really do want to at least be able to normal summon Theresia to activate her effect on your own turn, otherwise you lose half of your potential ways of getting to Frenzy in the first place. Also, bonus points if your deck doesn't need a normal summon, because oftentimes you'll be getting to Frenzy by normal summoning Theresia, so it would just be a lot nicer if there's nothing conflicting with that. Unfortunately, that means that this probably doesn't go super well with any deck using the Adventure Engine, because Rite of Armasir doesn't allow you to use the effects of any normal summon monsters in the same turn. In a meta where dimensional barrier is going around, the Dynamorphia package can also go really well into any non-fusion deck. That way it can be used as a backup plan after you get locked out of your other summoning mechanic. And it's even better if your other strategy wants level 4s for Synchro and Xyz plays, because after we normal summon Theresia to get to Frenzy, we don't actually need Theresia on board anymore, so at that point it can be really good to use for material to extend your other plays. The package can also go really well with other control strategies, because remember, you're putting your life points down super low, so if the only thing you have stopping your opponent from getting to your life points are a couple big monsters and one floodgate, you might be in a lot of danger, especially since we don't have access to the life point protection effects that we would if we were playing a full Dynamorphia deck. But if your other strategy is built full of ways to interact with your opponent and stop them from getting to your life points at all, then having Rexterm in addition to that could be exactly the push your deck needs to completely shut your opponent down. Of course, this package can also fit in just fine with a dinosaur deck. Those tend to not need a ton of extra deck space, and they're also already playing Fossil Dig, making you that much more likely to get to a frenzy if that's the play you want to make. Alright, now let's go the other direction and look at some individual cards that go really well into a full Dynamorphia deck. We'll start with some cards that specifically work really well with Kentrogena, the first of which is Skill Drain. This does turn off Kentrogena's effect to lower its own attack, so it will immediately go right up to its original attack of 4000. Another one is a card called Soul Strike. This is a trap that says, if your life points are 4000 or less, when an attack is declared involving a monster you control and an opponent's monster, you can pay half your life points, just like all our Dynamorphia traps, and then target one face that monster you control. That monster gains attack equal to the deficit between your current life points and 4000 until the end of your opponent's turn. That means that if you're already down at one life point, activating this can put your Kentrogena's attack all the way up to 7998. Unfortunately, like we talked about when we were discussing Dynamorphia Shell, battle related traps just aren't very good these days. There's just too high a chance of your opponent removing your monster from the field before they even go to the battle phase, in which case you end up not even having a target for this kind of card. Also, there are just so many other traps that can interrupt your opponent's turn, preventing them from even getting that attacking monster on the board in the first place. But if you really like seeing big attack points, but you hate that this one leaves you with such a weird number of attack points, we can look all the way back to the original starter decks, where we'll find a card called Reverse Trap. This is just a normal trap that says until the end phase, all effects that add or subtract attack or defense are reversed. So if we start by activating Domain to summon Kentrogena, we'll be at 4,000 life points, meaning Kentrogena will have zero attack. If we then activate Reverse Trap, instead of subtracting 4,000 from Kentrogena's attack, we'll be adding it, leaving us with a nice big 8,000 attack points. And if you're crazy enough to use Polymerization to make Kentrogena, meaning you still have 8,000 life points, then you're going to have a monster with a whopping 12,000 attack points. Of course, the objectively funniest play you can make is to have Kentrogena under Skill Drain, so its attack is 4,000, plus DNA Surgery to make it a warrior, then equip it with both Noble Arms Clorant, so it can attack directly, and Infra Noble Arms Hot Declare, so it can attack twice, giving us what may be the goofiest OTK that I have ever seen. Okay, now let's look at some cards that are actually good and pair well with the entire archetype instead of just focusing on Kentrogena's attack effect. First up are a couple obvious choices, like of course Fossil Dig is going to be a very good card for the deck. It gives you three more copies of Theresia, which means three more copies of Frenzy for your first turn. Really, a lot of the good generic dinosaur support is going to work well with the deck, including both Evolzar Dolka and Evolzar Logia. Since all of our main deck monsters are level 4 dinosaurs, we have access to these two very powerful rank 4s. But because our monsters don't really have any ways of summoning themselves, pretty uncommon that you'll be able to make one of these on your first turn. But they are very powerful cards, and extra deck space isn't super tight, so it's probably worth running at least a copy of each. Also, since two of our fusions are level 6, we could make Evolzar Solda. It has a very nice type of interruption that doesn't exist in the archetype proper, and it can get rid of a Stealth Burgia if we don't have access to one of the traps to destroy it. That all sounds great, but there is one big problem here. Once those fusion monsters become Xyz material, there's no longer any way to trigger their floating effect. So unless somehow making Solda is how we push for game, even though it doesn't really have a push for game type of effect, it'll be pretty disruptive to our plays going forward. So it kind of feels like we're probably going to want to pass on this one. Miscellaneousaurus is definitely a good card for the deck. Monster protection is something that this deck is severely lacking in, so being able to give it to all your monsters 
with just one card is fantastic. It's a banish effect to special summon something from the deck might be a bit too costly for this deck, but the protection effect alone is more than enough to make this card worth playing. A good card with a banish effect that isn't too costly for the deck is Ultimate Conductor Tyranno, obviously a very powerful dinosaur monster, and it requires you to banish two dinosaurs from the graveyard to summon it. Now remember, after we activate Frenzy and then use Cantrogenia to copy it, we'll have two of our fusion monsters in the graveyard that were never properly summoned before they ended up there. That means that they are not valid targets for our floating effects, so if they get banished, we're not really losing anything from our rotation. In general, they would be considered dead cards in the graveyard, unless we have something like Ultimate Conductor Tyranno to make use of them. Moving away from dinosaur cards, we have Lord of the Heavenly Prison. This is a fantastic card for any back row deck, but especially Dynamorphia, because our big playmakers can only be activated during the main phase, and if we get to one of them using Theresia, the spell and trap zone where we set it is super telegraphed. So if our opponent has quick play back row removal like Mystical Space Typhoon or Twin Twister, then we won't even get a chance to activate them. Unless, of course, we have Lord of the Heavenly Prison protecting them. And then once we do activate them, it'll become a big body on board and get us access to literally any spell or trap from our deck. Being a trap deck that likes to pay life points, Solemn Judgment is a great fit for the deck. Solemn Strike, on the other hand, we should be wary of. Even though it's a very strong card, anything that makes you pay a flat amount of life points is super dangerous, because you'll very quickly end up just not able to activate them. So as soon as you get below 1500 life points, every copy of Solemn Strike is completely dead. And Dynamorphia is very good at getting below 1500 life points. It only takes three effect activations to get there. So basically, unless you see it in your opening hand, and there's a good time to use it early in your opponent's turn, then you really don't want to see the card at all. Sticking with the trap deck idea, if you find yourself with room to spare in the main deck, and the only thing you really want is more access to one of your normal traps, then Trap Trick could be what you're looking for. It does come with the restriction that you can only activate one more trap for the rest of the turn after a Trap Trick resolves. However, since Kentrogena can copy a trap in the graveyard, we actually have access to two trap effects instead of just one. Technically, this is only as good as the normal traps it can get us access to, but luckily, all four of our Dynamorphia normal traps are great cards, and that's not even to mention cards like Ice Dragon's Prison, or any other normal traps that you might be playing from outside the archetype. Speaking of, Ice Dragon's Prison works great to supplement the fact that the only in archetype removal is a destruction, and too many cards today either have destruction protection or they get something good when they're destroyed. Compulsory Evacuation Device can serve this purpose too. We already talked about the deck play under skill drain, but what about the other floodgates? Well, the archetype proper has exactly zero spells, so Anti-Spell Fragrance seems like a pretty good card to include. Also, all of the monsters are dark dinosaurs, so we can play both Gozen Match and Rivalry of the Warlords. The recently unbanned Wall of Revealing Light might seem like an obvious include at first, until you do a little bit of life point math. It basically has the same problems as Solemn Strike. If you open it, it can actually be a very good card, letting you pay all the way down to 1000 life points right away, and then as long as it's on the field, basically no monster your opponent puts down will be able to attack. So two major problems are, even in that situation, removal of a single back row card is pretty easy to come by these days, and also, you have to pay life points in multiples of 1000, and just like we talked about earlier with Solemn Strike, three card activations is going to put you at exactly 1000 life points, meaning you can't even activate it anymore, so it's probably better to just stay away from this one. The always hilarious Ferret Flames is actually right at home in a Dynamorphia deck. During a game, you will very quickly get to a point where this card will shuffle back your opponent's entire field. And because of how the card works, that even includes monsters that are normally totally unaffected by card effects. The only thing it won't shuffle back is monsters with zero attack. Technically, our monster floating effects don't need to be triggered by our opponent's cards. We can trigger them ourselves. So if you find yourself in a situation where your opponent is just gaining too much board presence, a well-timed Torrential Tribute could be a huge swing in your favor. But with so many other cards having floating effects these days, you'll have to be very careful about both the specific matchup and the timing of this card, because your board will probably still be a bit weaker afterwards, and the last thing you want is to hurt yourself more than you hurt your opponent. An interesting card I came across when researching this video is called Quiet Life. Now, it's not a very good card, but it is an interesting card, and it also works as a good exercise in determining whether or not an interesting card with a bit of synergy will actually be good for your deck. Quiet Life is a continuous spell, and it says that you can only activate it at the start of your main phase 1, and only if you control no monsters. And basically, it's a two-sided floodgate that says if any player normal summons or sets a monster, that player cannot special summon that turn. And the other way too, if you special summon, you can't normal summon or set. Now at first, this is a pretty cool effect. A lot of decks need their normal summon, or at the very least, will be a lot less effective without it. But one of the neat things about Dynamorphia is that you do most of your special summoning on the opponent's turn, so normal summoning Theresia on your turn won't conflict with any of your fusion summoning. The problems start to arise when you think about how it fits into a game. Obviously, if you open this card, it's good. It's a neat floodgate that you can just activate right away at the beginning of your first turn. But what if you don't open it? What if you draw it on your second turn? Well, either you have monsters on board at that point, or you don't. If you do, then it's a dead card, and you're going to be mad that you drew it. Technically, you could activate something like a Torrential Tribute during your standby phase to clear your board, but you wouldn't even be able to use their floating effects, because that would just put more monsters on the board. So that's just a horrible idea. But what about the case where we get to our second turn and have no monsters on board? Well, what that means is 
our opponent was able to break through our board on their turn, which makes it very likely that they still have monsters on board. So the last thing we want to see is a floodgate that affects their ability to summon monsters, because they don't need to do that anymore. They have their monsters, they just need to activate effects and attack. When our board has been actively cleared by our opponent, what we need is an engine piece to rebuild our board. We need something that will gain us card advantage, and this random non-archetypal floodgate is not that. 10 times out of 10, if we're in this situation, what we want to see is one of our fusion traps to get us back into our good monsters, or alert to just get one back from the graveyard, or Theresia to get to one of those. The other thing to consider is that your deck does not exist in a vacuum. Very recently, the Adventure Engine, which locks you out of using the effects of normal summoned monsters, was incredibly popular. What that tells us is that there are a lot of decks going around right now that are actually totally fine skipping their normal summon, so there's a good chance that this would barely hurt your opponent at all. A much better alternative to this card would be Summon Limit. It would hurt you a little bit, but you can totally get away with just two summons in a turn, and if your opponent's playing a combo deck, it'll definitely hurt them, and way more than it hurts you. Okay, just hear me out on this one. The Winged Dragon the final card I want to touch on is called End of the Line. It conveniently came out in Battle of Chaos, right alongside the first Dynamorphia cards. And it's just a normal trap that says if your life points are lower than 100, draw 2. Then, if your life points are lower than 10, draw 2 more. This card basically sounds tailor-made for the Dynamorphia archetype, and there's never a time where you wouldn't want to draw 4 cards. But let's stop for a second and do the math. Assuming your opponent has done no damage to you, you would need to activate 7 card effects to get down to 63 life points where you would get the plus 1, and 10 card effects to get down to 8 life points to get the plus 3. And that is definitely way too much setup for a mostly unsearchable card, even if it has the potential for a blowout swing and advantage. And that's pretty much it. For the most part, nothing crazy. Really, any card you can expect to see in any trap deck, you can expect to see in a Dynamorphia deck, just with a little extra generic dinosaur support thrown in. Alright, now it's finally time to talk about the pros and cons of the archetype. First off, as a splashable package, I think it's pretty good. It's not about to win any huge tournament or anything, but dropping two huge monsters on the field during your opponent's turn, one of which is a floodgate, is always going to catch them off guard. Especially when you're not playing a full Dynamorphia deck, nobody's going to see that coming. Also, it can help you play around big board breaker cards like Dark Ruler No More and Lightning Storm, or like we talked about earlier, tricky cards like Dimensional Barrier. If your main strategy gets busted, you can just flip Frenzy and then suddenly you're back in the game. Also, I think this package is just super fun, and this is a game after all, so I think that counts for the pro list. Now for the cons of the package, there is a fair bit of fragility in having to activate Frenzy during your opponent's main phase, since they start the phase with priority, so they get to activate the first card, and it's possible that that one card gets them far enough that they'll either be able to negate Rexterm's effect, or maybe even just continue to combat completely undisturbed by his floodgate. And if they open something like Cosmic Cyclone or Mystical Space Typhoon, they can fire that off during their standby phase, and we can't even respond by activating Frenzy. We have to just let it die. Also, using Theresia's effect to set Frenzy from the deck is a super telegraphed play. Even if we have four back row cards, they'll know exactly which one is Frenzy, and there's just not much we can do about that. Also, the package takes up a bit of space. For a lot of decks, the extra deck is pretty tight these days, so four cards can be a bit much to ask. Main decks are a little bit more flexible usually, but seven is still a pretty big number, so you might just have a hard time fitting the package into your deck. And the final con that I want to bring up about the package is that you have to be very careful about your life points. This is definitely a go big or go home type of strategy. Dropping Rexterm is either going to win you the game or lose you the game very quickly. Because remember, if you're not playing a full Dynamorphia deck, you don't have all the other traps in your graveyard to protect your life points. So putting yourself down super low might really backfire. I've already mentioned it a couple times, but you don't want to go down to a thousand life points and then your opponent just looks at you and says, okay, long you on pitch melee. As far as the full archetype goes, I think right now it makes for a solid rogue deck. Being able to easily get two big bodies on board, one of whom is a floodgate, is really nice. I also really like how the traps are mostly just simple good effects. We have two fusion summons, a reborn, a destruction, and a gate into token summon, and then just ways of copying those effects. No need to overcomplicate things, just do what you need, and then pick which one you want to do again. Also for an archetype that needs to lower its life points, it was absolutely crucial that they had ways to protect what few life points they had remaining, and I think they found an incredible way to incorporate that, by just having it as a secondary graveyard effect on all of the traps. Because theoretically, if you're activating a bunch of traps in your trap deck, your graveyard should be full of them, right? Well, that brings us to the con list, because unfortunately, there really just aren't enough ways to get your traps into rotation. We have one monster that sets one from the deck when it's summoned, and another that sends one to the graveyard when it's summoned, and that's it. And on top of that, we have three monster effects that we need to banish traps from the graveyard for, so a lot of our traps that do end up in the graveyard to protect us are just as likely to get banished for something else. If they had like a fusion monster that could search a trap, or maybe another main deck monster who's on summon effect would recycle a banished trap back into the graveyard, that could help a lot with mitigating the 
this problem. Like maybe a level 2 monster so that alert could bring back both Kentrogena and it, and then you would get to recycle something for Kentrogena to copy. That would be amazing. But unfortunately right now I feel like the deck just needs a little bit more. And this directly leads into the next problem. The archetype does have some nice interruption, but that doesn't matter if you can't get access to it. So if your opponent is able to get rid of your Rexstorm with something like Ultimate Slayer or Super Polymerization, or even if they're just able to negate its effect, and you don't have a response to that, then suddenly you have very few life points, and potentially not much you can do about it. And finally, the thing that's keeping this from probably ever seeing competitive play is the current time rules. Matches in official tournaments only go for 45 minutes, and when time gets called, the game ends at the end of whatever phase it's in. And at that point, whoever has more life points wins that game. And unfortunately, if your match is taking the whole 45 minutes, that means you're probably in game 3, meaning in that match you have one win and one loss. And if you're playing Dynamorphit, you're pretty much always going to have fewer life points than your opponent, meaning when time gets called, you're almost definitely going to lose the match. All in all, Dynamorphy is an incredibly explosive, go big or go home type of strategy that is super fun to play. It would just be nice if it could explode a little more consistently and maybe a little bit bigger too. And that's the basics of Dynamorphia. I hope you liked the video and found it helpful. Let me know what you thought in the comments and let me know what you think of the archetype. I know I have a lot of fun playing it, but being so low on life points is definitely a very stressful experience that is not for everybody. And that's it. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a nice day.